All right, um, we are jumping into a brand new series this morning on the book of Esther. And I will freely admit, this is probably the most difficult uh, series that I have ever preached in my life as far as like studying and, and research. In fact, throughout church history, this has been maybe the most challenging book of the Bible. Uh, in fact, for the first 700 years of, of the Christian church, uh, there was no commentary written from a Christian perspective on the book of Esther. I, I mean, think about that for a second. 700 years of the church and nothing written. In fact, John Calvin, who's, who's uh, famous for his commentary on all of Scripture, he skipped Esther. <laughs> he skipped Esther. In fact, Martin Luther, for example, he didn't think that Esther should be even in the Bible. Um, now, uh, I believe that God has has put his scripture together and that, that the Bible that we have today is representative of the word of God that he wants us to have. And if it's in there, it's in there for a reason. And um, I was reading through one of the commentaries uh, and <laughs> here it's, it's really interesting um, what this particular commentator wrote and I just bumped and lost my spot. Uh, here we go. This is what she wrote. I thought this was so good. It says, The story of Esther is perfect guidance for us when we find ourselves in a situation where right and wrong are not so clearly defined, and every choice we have seems to be a troubling mixture of good and bad. Anybody ever relate to that situation? It is perfect inspiration for us when we find ourselves in situations we never sought, we never planned for, and we don't think that we have the gifts to succeed at. It tells us what to do. Trust these situations to the Lord and move forward. There are no books, secular or biblical, that give us one, two, or three-step procedures for what to do in every tough situation. But in all 66 books of the Bible, they rest their cases in the fact that God is the lead character of the universe and that our initial response to that and to all situations confronting us is prayerful acknowledgement that God rules. Now that's good. I, 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 I'm not even going to ask you if you think that's good. I know that's good. That is a good statement and something that, that we can look at. And so as we look at this difficult book together, a book, by the way, that never mentions the name of God in the entire 10 chapters, it doesn't even address who God is, but there are, he's still the main character. He's still the one that's most important. So uh, as we look at this, we're going to find a story that's filled with drunkenness, with manipulation, with sex, with murder. We're even going to see the heroes in this story participating in some of this bad behavior. And we're going to walk through this entire story. We're going to look at mostly two people, Mordecai and Esther, and see how God used them despite their own flaws and despite the very, very messy situation that they found themselves in. We're going to break this series up into four, uh, four messages, four messages, ten chapters. we got a lot to cram in there. So here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to read through every single verse. Um, I'm going to kind of highlight certain passages. You're going to hear the whole story, and we're going to read parts of it. But what I would encourage you to do over the next few weeks it's only 10 chapters. You could read it in a day. Uh, it wouldn't even take you that long. But read through the entire book so you have the full context. So as we're going through this together, you can see how God worked in a difficult situation. And the, the name of this series uh, is actually found in chapter 4, verse 14. We're not going to get there this morning, but I want to read this verse to you because I want you to hear the heart of this series. In Esther 4.14, it says this, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is the, the um, theme of this series, that, that God is sovereign, that he's in control that we can trust in him, that his providence means 
that no situation is out of his control, that his hand takes bad situations and works them for our good. And if we understand the nature of our God and we believe in this truth about him, then we have to come to this conclusion that God is the one who placed us exactly where we are on this earth, that placed us around the people that are around us, that placed you in your job, that placed you in in circumstances, and even though you might fight against his will and his plan, that he is a good God, and he wants to use his people who are willing to submit to him and humble themselves and say, God, whatever you have for me, I'm trusting in you. And I think if we believe that about God, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from this incredible story. And by the way, it is not a boring story, all right? If you're bored during this series, it's your problem, all right? This is the stuff that movies are made out of. It's incredible, all right? So um, Esther, by the way, is also one of the very last books written in the Old Testament. Um, So this is... This is right before the 400-year silent period before the New Testament, before Jesus comes on the scene. Now, just to give you a little background as to what is happening in Esther, um, there was a, a king named Nebuchadnezzar who came and he conquered Jerusalem and he took Israel into captivity and they were there for 70 years. And the book of Daniel talks about um, Israelites who were in that period of captivity in Babylon. Well, then a guy named Cyrus became king of Persia, and he defeated Babylon. And actually, the Bible praises him. They don't do this a lot. They don't praise for the Bible doesn't praise foreign leaders a lot. But in this instance, there was this guy named Cyrus, and they said that that he believed that no man should be a slave. And so he freed the Jews and allowed them to return to their homeland. Um, Unfortunately, many had become accustomed to their new life in Babylon and stayed behind. And that's the case for the families of Mordecai and Esther, and and probably through a couple generations, they were living as Jews in a foreign land, probably believing in the God of of the Jews, in the God that, that we believe in and that we serve, but living secretly as Jews in a foreign land. And now there's a new king of Persia, and his name is Ahasuerus. Um, That's his Persian name, but he also was known by another name. His Greek name is Xerxes. Have you ever heard of Xerxes before? Um, Xerxes, just to give you a little background about him, he inherited the throne from his father, and um, he quickly expanded it. In fact, At the time of his reign, he had the largest empire that had ever existed. In fact, he was king over most of the known world at that time. Um, Now, I have not seen this movie, and I don't think you should either due to the inappropriate content, but Xerxes' life was recently depicted in the movie 300, and uh, that was about his life. And so the story of Esther starts actually with the story of Xerxes. It starts with the royal banquet that lasted um, quite some time. In fact, calling it a banquet is probably a little bit of an understatement. This was a flat-out party. Um, What he did is he gathered all his military leaders and governors and, and nobility from different regions all across his kingdom, brought them together to his palace to have a rager for 180 days. Okay? Think about this. Has anybody ever been to a party that's lasted six months long before? Now, here's here's the deal. (laughs) King Xerxes wanted to inspire loyalty among his subjects. So he was going to make these people um, say, I would do anything for King Xerxes. So he invited them in. He partied. They had an open bar for six months. They came and drank and and did all sorts of terrible, horrible things um, for, for this incredible party. And after that was over, uh, the party lasted 180 days, and Xerxes thought, you know what we should do next? We should have another party. And so for seven days, he invited the people of the city, the commoners, to come into the palace and partake of this party. And seven days of celebrating and debauchery and, and terrible stuff ensued. 
In fact, um, they describe a little bit of what was going on in the palace at this time and how wealthy King Xerxes was. Um, among all of the incredible ornate descriptions of his palace, one of the things that caught my attention is that they actually had couches made of gold. Couches made of gold. Like, what did you make your couch out of? Oh, pure gold. <laughs> like, this is incredible wealth, right? This guy was um, seen as, uh, in fact, he referred to himself as the king of kings, right? He thought of himself as a god, and people worshipped him in that way. So after seven days of incredible partying, um, that time is, is wrapping up. Um, he's been drinking probably nonstop. In fact, the Bible actually says, uh, he's, they, they say it this way, that, um, that the, on the seventh day, the king was merry with wine. And uh, he gives this command to this, the seven eunuchs uh, that, that work for him. Now, let me give you a, a little bit of cultural understanding so we can interpret what that means. When, when the Bible says that he was merry with wine, that means that he was flat out hammered because he'd been drinking for 187 days. <laughs> And so he gets together with his boys. And now here's the deal. They have, actually have two parties going on. All the men are partying together and all the women are at a separate party. And that's why this party went terribly wrong, right? You take all the women out of the equation and all the men do stupid things. And, and he gets together with his boys and he's like, listen, everybody needs to see how hot my wife is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my seven eunuchs, and, and these were guys that were in service of the king. And uh, in case you're not familiar with the term eunuch, that means that they've been castrated. All right? Like I said, this story is full of craziness. All right? And so these guys were in charge of the king's harem, but they, they had um, some measures taken to make sure that they weren't tempted in any way. Okay? I mean, can you imagine going and telling your mom, hey, mom, I got a job. Well, what, are you, what are you doing? Oh, I'm in charge of the king's harem. But the bad news is I'm now a eunuch, <laughs> okay? Like, oh, that's discouraging, right? And so he sends um, these seven eunuchs. He says, go and, and get my wife and bring her out so that she can prance around and everyone can see how beautiful she is. And the eunuchs, of course, go to her and say, Listen, the king wants you to come out and show everyone how beautiful you are. And she responds to her husband, tell my drunk husband I'm not doing that. Now, actually, over the years of church history, there's been a fair amount of debate as to who was in the wrong here, whether it was Vashti or the king. Whether it was Vashti was actually um, not being in, in the right attitude of submission to her husband in refusing it. Now, the Bible does say that you should honor your husband, that you should submit yourself to him. But here's the reality, and I'm going to say this for everyone here present. If your husband is telling you to do something sinful, tell him to shove it, okay? Like, that is not, you have a higher authority than your husband, and it's God, okay? So you shouldn't be participating in his sin just because he thinks it's a good idea. But of course, he's the king. He has not been told no in his entire life. In fact, he was born in a palace. He was raised by a king. He's had everything handed to him his entire life, and nobody tells this guy no. So somebody told him no, and what do you think happens? He flies off the handle, right? He loses his mind, and he gets together with his seven most trusted advisors. Think about, like, uh, the president getting together with his cabinet. And this is what they're talking about in this important business meeting Here's what they, the conclusion that they come to. Listen, King, if she tells you no, all the other wives are going to see that she told you no, and they're going to think, we can tell our husbands no too. This is the important meeting that, that I mean, this is the, the conclusion that they come to. The most brilliant advisors, they're worried that, that this moment is going to create a problem all across the kingdom of wives just going crazy and telling their husbands no. And so here they are in this situation, and they get together and they say, listen, I don't think it would be overkill at all to make a royal decree 
that she should never be in your presence again. Now, here's the irony. Vashti's punishment for refusing to be in the presence of the king was that she was not allowed to be in the presence of the king any longer. I, if, if I were Vashti in that instance, I would be like, okay, sounds great. Thank you very much. It's a win. In fact, historians actually tell us that Vashti was originally Xerxes' brother's wife and that he saw her and was like, you know what? I would like you to be my wife. If I were Vashti, I'd be like, that's fine. I like your brother better anyway, <laughs> you know? Um, so all this goes on. He makes this royal decree. They send it to, to all the nations so that everybody's wives know that they can't tell their husband no. And then um, four years actually go by between this point and the next part of the story. And Xerxes has had a hard four years. He had lost a war to the Greeks. Um, he had been through, through a difficult time, and at some point, he decided he was kind of missing his wife. And he was probably a little annoyed with some of the leaders who convinced him to banish her. And so they decided, they came up with a plan, and, and here was their brilliant solution to the problem. We are going to hold a competition, and we're going to bring together young women from all over the kingdom and we're going to do their makeup, and we're going to give them some nice clothes, and we're going to make them smell good. You're going to get to know them a little bit, and you're going to pick your new queen from them. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the original first season of The Bachelor. <laughs> right? No idea is a new idea. They just stole this from the Bible, okay? Uh, let's start reading in Esther chapter 2. We're going to read in verse 5. It says, Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now, um, I just heard this the other day. If you are, um, ever have the opportunity to read the Bible out loud and um, you come to a bunch of names that you're like, I have no idea how to pronounce them, just read them with confidence because nobody else knows how to pronounce them either. And they'll just assume that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. So the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who, was, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. And he was bringing up Hasada, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, when many of the young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with cosmetics and a portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. All right, so uh, we already talked about the fact that, that Mordecai and Esther were products of the exile into Babylon, that they were now part of this kingdom and they had stayed behind when, when many of the Jews had headed back to Jerusalem. They were away from their friends. They were away from their place of worship. They were away from their culture. And they were forced to adopt a new way of life. Now imagine being a Jew, believing in the one true God, and being unable to sacrifice, unable to follow the dietary restrictions, unable to worship in the temple, and then on top of that, you have Esther, who was orphaned and was adopted by her cousin, Mordecai. Now, um, there's actually some speculation. In fact, the way that it's written in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the, the Old Testament scriptures, that actually suggests that Mordecai took her as his wife. Uh, but that doesn't really make sense in the scope of the story. It, even in this crazy story, it's crazy enough. So that's probably wrong. All right. Um, scripture was, says that, that she's pretty. And so Mordecai is thinking, you know what? This, this whole 
contest might work out in our benefit. This might be useful. And so Esther goes and she enters the palace and immediately finds favor with Haggai, who's in charge of the cast of season one. And uh, he immediately recognizes that this is a front runner, so she gets the most romantic one-on-one date of this entire episode. Okay, I'll drop the Bachelor stuff now. All right. Now, we're going to talk more uh, about this story, but I want us to stop here and acknowledge two points. Um, First of all, God can redeem every messy situation. Now, none of the behavior in this particular passage of Scripture was pleasing or God-honoring including the heroes of this story, right? God certainly doesn't condone drunkenness. The behavior of this king was disgusting. (laughs) Everything that happened in this story was just gross. But here's the part that bothered me the most, actually. That Mordecai, who had adopted this orphan Esther, allowed her to be taken into this beauty pageant. So... I mean, I think that's reckless parenting, right? Here's essentially what she's being called in to do. She's going to go spend an entire year in the spa, six months with some oils and six months with some perfumes and stuff like that. By the end, if she's not smelling good, I don't know. There's no hope whatsoever. And then she's sent off to spend one night in the king who's going through all these women one by one, spending one night with them. The Bible doesn't explicitly say what they're doing, but you can probably put two and two together in this story, right? She has one night with this king, and if if for some reason she pleases him, then she's invited back, right? That's messed up. Now, there's also Queen Vashti, who is absolutely the victim in this story, but already God is redeeming this mess, He's already setting in place people that he can use for his purpose. He's taking something that's broken and sinful and disgusting. And I don't think Mordecai is the picture of righteousness in this story. I don't even think Esther comes out great early on in this story. But here's the good news. Our God is good. Our God is sovereign. And he can take what's broken and he can take what's wrong, and he can use it for something good. And we don't get to hear the good part until week four. I mean, it's, it's coming. You got to hang in there. But I promise you, it is coming. Here's the second thing I want us to notice. When God calls you to something, he sends his favor with you. Now, personally, I don't even think Esther should have been in that palace. If I were Mordecai, I'd be like, we're leaving the country. We're getting out of here. We're doing whatever we can to keep you away from that maniac. Right, this is probably a teenage girl being sent to a homicidal, um, crazed, sexual predator. And, and in this broken situation, um, Esther could have very easily just found herself as part of the king's harem at some point. But God's hand was in the details. He created her the way that um, he formed her. He made her to be attractive and appealing to the king. He paved the way for her to be recognized. Now, I want to ask a question, and this is just something to think about. At the end of this story, it's very clear that Esther had embraced her identity, and even though it isn't explicitly stated, I believe that she was a God-fearing woman at the end of this story. But I'm not so sure she was in this moment. I think she was kind of going along with what the world was dealing her in that moment. And I'm not saying that it was her fault that she wound up in the situation that she was in. But there's no evidence that like, God was actually working in her heart in this moment that she was being obedient to what God had called her to do. In fact, she was hiding her identity as a Jew from everyone. And... Um, If you know the whole story, you know that that becomes a big deal in the future. Maybe if she would have been honest about who she was and about the God that she served from the beginning, there never would have been a decree to kill all the Jews. Spoiler alert. All right. 
Now, uh, here's the cool thing. God elevated her, even though she didn't maybe really even deserve it at this time. And even though she wasn't even ready for what God had for her in that moment, his hand was on her life. Each of the the women in this contest spent 12 months working on their appearance, right? And in those 12 months, she was identified as somebody that stood out. And they would go and spend a, a date with the king, and if they... They pleased the king. They received a rose and, uh, okay, one more bachelor reference. They would be invited back. Um, Let's keep reading in verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except for what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now, Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to the king Ahasuerus in his royal place in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. and She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and his servants. It was Esther's feast, and he also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Nothing says party like a tax cut. Right? Now, the story actually takes another turn from there. And we're going we're gonna to cover just one more piece of this story. There's, I'm telling you, there's so much here. We don't even hardly have time to get through it all. Um, but while all this is going on, Mordecai is incredibly nervous about what's happening to Esther. And the Bible tells us that every day he would go to the gates and he would ask and try to get information about Esther and about what's going on in her life. And so one day, as he's chilling at the gate, uh, he overhears something. He hears a plot to take the king's life. The Bible tells us that Esther had been told by Mordecai not to tell people who she was and that she was Jewish. But let's, let's read what happens in verse 21 of chapter 2. It says, In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, apparently they can't be trusted afterwards, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, who told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now that is pretty cool, right? I, I mean, he did something great there. He, he uncovered this plot. Listen, if, if I were Mordecai in this situation, I'm like, my cousin is married to this homicidal maniac. I think we should probably just you know, let him be assassinated. Like life would be better for her if, if we did this. But he does the right thing and, and he stops this plot. He communicates it. And now the king even has his name recorded in the book of Chronicles. It's they're acknowledging this is because of Mordecai. And you're thinking, yes, the solution to all the problems. Now Mordecai is going to get a position. He's going to be acknowledged. He's going to be recognized. We find out next week it doesn't necessarily work that way. In fact, next week we're going to introduce another character to the story. He is the villain and he's a bad guy. He is not a nice guy. Um, But not only has Esther been made queen, but Mordecai uncovers this plot, saves the king's life. God is positioning these cousins to do something big. Mordecai and Esther are making, frankly, bad choices in some ways. They're living in the wrong place. They're participating in a culture that's in opposition to God's law. They're concealing the fact that they believe in the God of the Bible. 
And they're involved in this gross process of selecting a new queen. But yet God is taking their sin. He's taking their tragedy. He's taking their circumstances and he's using it for his glory. As we wrap things up today, I want to ask you a question. What has God positioned you to do? Where has he placed you for a time such as this? Ask the worship team to come as as we close this morning. But I want you to really think about that question. Whose life has God placed you in so that you can tell them about Christ? I, I want to tell you a story uh, something that happened this week, you know, we were, we were kind of talking about this idea in staff meeting and um, just how we need to be intentional about being people who are committed to sharing our faith. And, and one of the things I challenge our staff to do is over these next two weeks between our, our meetings that, that we'd find somebody and we'd have a conversation, somebody who's not a believer, who's not a part of our church, that we have a conversation about our faith and about Christ with them. And, uh, you know, the week went by and I never really had an opportunity that kind of presented itself. So I was like, okay, well, I'll I'll make an opportunity. And I I sent some messages to some friends. And and one of the guys that God put on my heart is a friend who I I referee with. And um, he's had a hard year. He's had had cancer treatments. Uh, He just went through his second round of chemo. We've been praying for him, and um, just it's, it's not necessarily looking the most hopeful, uh, but I'm believing that, that God can work a miracle and that, that he can use it for his glory. And um, So I sent out a couple messages to a couple different people. He was the only one that responded. Uh, and I said, like, okay, well, eh. so we, we talked a little bit over, over Messenger, and I was like, okay, God, just I'm looking for an opportunity for a chance to, to talk with him. And, and I went to my, my daughter's soccer game the next night, sent these messages on Monday, Tuesday night, went to her soccer game. Guess who the referee was? So he comes over before the game and we start talking and let him know I'm praying for him. I believe God can heal him. And, um, and he, was, he was moved by that. We had a really great conversation in that moment. Went on Thursday night to my other daughter's soccer game. Guess who the referee was? If you believe in, in coincidences that everything just happens uh, in the way that it's going to happen and, and things just, you know, happen as they will, I feel sorry for you. God's plans are bigger than our ideas of how this world can operate. And if we have faith in who God is and the way that he moves and the way that he operates, we trust what scripture says about him to be true, then shouldn't we live every day with an expectation that people that we have interactions with, that God has placed them in our path for a reason? If you're going to wander through life aimlessly, just believing that stuff just happens the way it happens, then you don't believe in the same God that I do. And I'm guilty as as everyone else in failing to acknowledge that that those opportunities that we have are just just coincidence. But it's not true. Our God is a big God. He has everything in his hand. And as we trust in him, he's faithful. We need to start seeing those opportunities, not as coincidence, but as divine appointments that God is bringing people into our lives for such a time as this. You're not at the job that you're at because they're the ones that decided to hire you. You're there because God wants you there. And the coworkers that that you interact with, they need 
the God of the universe. They need the one that created us. They need the one that loves us. Guess whose responsibility it is to point them to that God? It's ours. Every single day, let's live our lives on purpose. I'm going to pray and then we'll sing a song to close this morning. But as God is speaking to you right now, I just ask that you just listen to the Holy Spirit for a second. Say, God, who is it? Who are you speaking right now? What name are you putting in my heart that needs to hear about your love, that needs to hear about your goodness and your faithfulness? Or give me an opportunity to share that love with them. Heavenly Father, we thank you this, this morning that, that you're in control your providence is something that we can trust in, that your faithfulness is something that we can rely on. Lord, we know that you take every situation, God, in our broken, sinful world, and you can take that situation and use it for good. Lord, we're trusting in that promise today. So God, give us opportunities to share your love with the people around us. In Jesus' name.